can. So thank you and welcome everyone this evening to the next Regen Ag live chat. Um, we're really, really pleased to be joined by Jamie this evening, who is, we have named him the international uh, man of micro riser and minerals which is a very bad title um, but this evening we're we're going to be talking to Jamie for the next hour or so really about the various work he does from around the world with different um, sort of in different landscapes with um, and different farmers but mainly to do with cattle ranching particularly beef cattle but we will do some chat on goats and sheep. Um, just to be clear in terms of hopefully if if you can't hear me if you've got any issues in terms of audio uh, please write in the chat box um, what that does if you're not familiar with zoom um, you, at the bottom of your screen when you sort of hover over might not look exactly like this um, but you'll see these some uh, well usefully I've cut the bottoms off but you've got two boxes one which two speech bubbles which is question answer so if you type into there um, type a question and then we can either type an answer or we'll go through it and then as ever Joseph Keating's here to um, take you through those questions um, if you want to do a general chat so um, and that's to everybody you can um, everybody can uh, read them please feel free to put it into those boxes so either of those boxes will be monitored by Joseph this evening and as standardly as we go through as we go through the whoo she's here um I'm filling. Uh, as we go through the evening, oh. uh, we will um, we'll be interjected with questions. So as you think of the questions, please feel free to type them into either of those boxes and Joseph will deal with them at the appropriate time. Welcome, Nick. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I have a little bit. We don't sweat. We, remember, women glow. We don't sweat. Oh, well. like <laughs> um, Extreme oh, glowing oh. going on. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I, and also I forgot to say thank you very much to Fiona Lovett who has helped us this, uh, this evening and also lent uh, her lent us her Zoom subscription. So again, thank you very much Fiona for that and Flock Health Limited. Um, as ever, the uh, the YouTube, um, sorry, the recording of it will be put on YouTube and also we'll be pulling out of podcasts which will go um, up in the next few days. So they that standard and a link will be sent around for those or. Uh, if you want to listen or watch it again those are available so what we'll st what we'll do is is nick are you um are you composed i'm sorry i just want to see if these work so let's keep going for a minute i'll keep going so yeah so um so the what we'd also appreciate after this is just feedback in terms of we've moved from teams obviously into zoom so we'd also appreciate some feedback um i'm not sure nick is a fan and um also that we've moved from every two weeks or every month so again we'll appreciate some thoughts and, and the other thing i suppose i could announce now is that we have made the slightly tough decision to postpone carbon calling so it was meant to be held this august um but with various things in terms of quarantine and particularly joel coming into the country um, we just can't see it can work this year. So we've spoken to Joel and uh, we're moving it to next June um, and it fits alongside Groundswell. Pros and cons, it's going to be a weekend. Um, and I know it's slightly, well, we we're very annoyed the fact it can't go away, go ahead this year, but it's not alone in terms of stuff that needs to be moved into 2021. I'm going to go to Oh. Oh, oh we We've annoyed him already. Uh, do you think we should just say a little bit about carbon calling just briefly before for those uh, possibly new people? So sorry, I should have said, so Carbon Carbon Calling is a conference that was meant to be held the first time this August up in Cumbria, and it was really to try and bring together people who had a real interest in grass and forage, particularly of a regen uh, angle. Um, so yeah, so, and obviously for COVID and other reasons, we've decided to postpone it to next June. Um, and more details will be sent round shortly. Um, it's going to be a weekend, so we'll, it'll just be a big party, a regenerative party. And obviously we'll learn a lot and then forget it all quite quickly in the bar. Um, and the other thing to say, if anybody has bought tickets, you will be contacted in the next few days and to arrange a refund, or you can uh, choose to keep the tickets and they'll be honoured for the next one. Okay, we've done the admin. Uh, are your headphones working? No, I'm just going to... <laughs> going well uh so uh how are things nick generally how are things it's rained a lot it's since last week um 
I've spent a day sorting ewes and lambs out with Renna, my husband. So I've been shouted that quite a lot. And, um, uh, quite glad to be away from him. But no, it's it's rain, so everything is is growing like crazy. I think the dry spell will have hit hit us in lamb growth a bit. But um, no, generally everything's going all right. Um, and I'm quite excited for our international speaker, our first one. Indeed. Jamie, no pressure. Um, so what we'll do, Jamie, if, if it's OK, it will make a start. And if you can introduce yourselves to the people, we've got around how many people have we got on? We've got about 60 people online at the moment and okay. there'll be a few more joining us. So just a bit of background in terms of, um, well, how do you how how have you found yourself on this evening's Regen live chat? Thank uh, you. Yes. Um, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I've been on this uh, quest to regenerate the landscape and the environment. I believe all my life, my life. I'm an uh, agronomy engineer by uh, education, but I quickly found out that if I applied the general or conventional recommendations, I would lose pants and shirt uh, because I did it for a full year. And then I had to uh, regenerate the land that had been affected by the chemical fertilizers. Since then, I have researched and searched for the best people in the world to be my mentors in whatever I am interested in. So in, um, in Ruminant Nutrition, I followed uh, Mark Bader, and I eventually had the franchise for Mexico for Free Choice Enterprises for 18 years. And that gave me uh, the scope of working with different environments in nutrition. Then I met, I invited Johan Sitzman from uh, Zimbabwe, Africa to my house in 2007 or 2008. He stayed there for a month with his wife and we traveled the country and he taught me a lot. And then we started teaching together in 2013. And I kept learning and practicing on my own ranches, which I have two in Mexico, and on the ranch that I was managing in Florida since April of 2012. And then in 2013, we started doing rounds in the United States in different environments, uh, teaching a course called uh, Sustainable Ranching, which I later, later changed to Regenerative Ranching. But now I prefer the term of uh, real wealth farming that encompasses everything because um, in, in other um, methods, they call themselves that they want to take the whole into account, but they usually don't. So I wanted to encompass more, uh, like not only lifestyle and, and social issues, but really regenerate the land and the world to where it will create real wealth. And that includes our nutrition, our health, our happiness, our family, our family time, and of course our neighbors and social issues. But if we don't improve the land on which our livestock graze, we are not doing a service to our community. We have to improve it. And that's, it's been quite a common theme, hasn't it, in terms of sort of the well-being of the people and the community seems to be fundamental to regenerative approaches. Yes, it is. We are part of the whole. We are part of the ecosystem. Without us, it wouldn't function as well as it could if we do it right. Now, many people do it wrong, and that's why we have the bad press, and uh, that's why we are being attacked. It's easy just to change that by doing the proper management with the proper knowledge. And we should also just explain the photos uh, and to be on the screen, hopefully, that people can see. So okay. it's linked in terms of the title, in terms of, um, yeah, if you'd just like to explain what the photos okay, are. Okay, on the left, we can see a no till planting of a cool season annual. And you can see the, the green patches that are growing nicely. Mm -hmm and the other grasses are not growing in rows, are not growing well, and they are a different color. That's due to the mycorrhiza having been killed by any of what kills mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza is the fungi that infects the roots of the plants. 
Uh, it's like the, in the movie Avatar, where all the roots of the trees in the planet were in, interconnected. The same, they got the idea from mycorrhiza, which is the largest organism in the world. It can cover hundreds of square miles. And that way, plants deliver nutrients and moisture to one another. That's one of the functions. But the main function is to harvest the sugar exudates that the plant creates through photosynthesis and in return explores up to 300% more root area than the roots could do. So the mycorrhiza being a symbiotic relationship uh, fits the plant and the plant fits the mycorrhiza. So in that, in the situation there where it's obviously div like there's gaps in it in terms of, so is it a case of build it and that it will come or is it seed, do you mean, do you end up putting it, applying it or how would you deal with fields like that? Well, that's a, a no-till uh, uh, drill. You can see the, the, uh, the rows. Can you see yeah. them? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the first step is not to kill it. What kills mycorrhiza? Uh, tillage. Uh, number one, tillage. Number two, any eye, herbicide, fungicide, insecticide, kills it. Any uh, dewormer we use on our cattle, like ivermectin or things like that, will kill the mycorrhiza. Now, what feeds mycorrhiza? Mostly sugary root exudates, uh, liquid fish, uh, biodiversity underground, having legumes and grasses together, and uh, rock powders. Now, if we don't have mycorrhiza, because at first we are transitioning for, from a conventional farming to a real world farming, we can uh, put dry powder mycorrhiza into the seed, which is the best way that I have found and gives the best economical results. You only need to do it the first two or three years if, it, if it's severely degraded. Most farms do not require it. Okay, so it's just, it's part of that process of land conversion, isn't it, I suppose, is to build up that population. Yes. James, it's a, go ahead. Sorry, when you've, when you've um, killed all the mycorrhizae by using all the pesticides, fungicides, and how long does it take you to build that up again? I cannot hear you well. I can hear Liz well, but not you. Um, she, she, it, once you've killed it all off, how long, so if you were just allowing it to regenerate naturally, how long would it take? It depends to... on the severity of the degradation. Like okay. in Florida, where the land had been destroyed by uh, every two week application of glyphosate at high rates for 23 years, and it was very sandy soil, there wasn't any mycorrhiza. So I saw that the, the bolts were spreading the mycorrhiza in their tunnels because you could see those uh, green strips growing only in the burrows of the bolts. So I researched and they, they do uh, excrete in their droppings uh, millions of mycorrhiza spores per gram. So then I started applying the mycorrhiza in the seed and we started having the results we needed. So instead of losing time and money, with a very small investment in the mycorrhiza, you can jumpstart the process and not have to wait another two or three years. So it depends, it depends as always. Okay. In, in Katy, Texas, I arrived there and there was no mycorrhiza, but after the first few months, you could see the mycorrhiza advancing through the farm and it even crossed a gravel road. And you could see the green moving across the farm and it stayed green longer into a drought. That's mycorrhiza. And so and it's because it basically develops a greater rooting network. So it therefore can scavenge for more water, more nutrients than just the grassroots alone. And build humus. Without humus, uh, humus, we should remember is real soil fertility. Humus is a part of the organic matter that cannot be degraded down further. And it's what gives the brown color to soils. And no, I've just it that lasts for a hundred years or more, and, what, and that's what we have been mining. So I've just I've moved the slide on because you have a slide in terms of where that you can see the sort of well you can explain, but in terms of that dark layer is what you're after. Yes, the under where you hit, where you see the slide with the soil in it, that's the airstrip of that 
Mashona Farm in Florida, ah, which had been severely compacted, so air, airplanes could land there. So you can see that the roots that bring the liquid sunshine with them, that's carbon in the form of sugary exudate, root exudates. The roots bring the black soil or humus just as deep as they can reach. Beyond that hard layer, they cannot go through. So we broke that hard layer with a key lime plow from Australia. And now the roots can go deeper and increase the humus content to a deeper area. Uh, we need to remember that to create humus, we require green plants because humus, 90%, up to 90% of humus is created by dead bodies of microorganisms, bacteria mostly, that cycle and are being digested by other microorganisms with the last digestion being carried out by fungi. Without photosynthesis, we don't create the sugary root exudates for those microorganisms to feed on, and we do not increase humus, even if we apply, uh, if we trample down the forage by selective grazing, we will not create as much humus as if we do correct severe grazing with enough rest after that. And that's a bit that we really need to explore, isn't it? In terms of there's a lot of this sort of belief system that if you trample things and push it onto in, into contact with soil, that it will magically become organic matter quite quickly. It has to go through that process within the microorganisms. Yes. Uh, let's say, for example, uh, uh, a hectare of well-managed grass can put down uh, 10 to 20 tons of sugary root exudates per year. And that's what builds up the humus content. We have done sampling in Northern Iowa, which is cooler, more like you, but colder in the winter. And uh, we tested, or they did tested uh, a client of mine, the neighbor ranch where it had been continuous grazed, the worst management you can think of, and his farm that had been uh, selectively grazed with the mop grazing uh, top grazing, tall grazing, okay? Uh, after eight years, both had the same humus content. Didn't go up. So I'm showing you on the other picture where you can see how we started. That soil, had very sandy soil, had 1% organic matter, low in every nutrient you can think of, but not on calcium. And we improved the land just by grazing, grazing properly with cattle at high stock densities, at high carrying rate, superbly adapted cattle. And we ended up with what you see on the top part of that picture. That's a five years later, the same paddock uh, stockpile for winter use. And that, that gave us a 300 cow days per acre on that winter. So the key thing to, or is, I suppose, the important bit is that, so you're still grazing at relatively tall heights, aren't you? It's not a conventional sort of 12, 15 centimetre grazing height, but you're actively trying to get that animal to eat all of that forage off. Yes, yes, but that will depend on environment. In your okay. environment that you have cool season grasses, you are absolutely correct. And a tropical environment is different. Okay. I, and, um, do consult, I do consult all the way from Paraguay to Mexico tropics, to Highland, Mexico, to Canada, to France, to Scotland, and hopefully to England. And so I suppose in terms of this, this the sorry, Nick and Joseph, I don't know whether you, there's a few questions. Yeah, there's, there, a, just... there's, yeah there's a few questions um, that we could go through. Um, so one was, what is, what is it about liquid fish? that um, provides a benefit? Um, oh, yeah, uh, liquid fish allows the plant to produce, to increase the photosynthesis, photosynthetic activity. So you uh, increase the photosynthesis of that plant by applying liquid fish. And that in turn will increase the sugary root exudates that actually feed the mycorrhiza. Uh, legumes are essential in the first parts of the process. 
and then we have two similar questions is where do you get your mycorrhiza from um, for reseeding? In, in the United States, I get it from mycorrhizal solutions. And in Mexico, I just buy it locally. They produce it on, on the roots of uh, uh, sorghum seedlings. So okay. I just, sorry, sorry, Joseph, I just need to clarify. Liquid fish is, as it says, liquidized fish. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is a stupid yeah. question, but I needed it, to check this. Yes, it's fish, <laughs> hydro, 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 hydrolyzed fish. Okay. Uh, you can make it. Your, you can make your own. Just put the fish heads in a drum and cover it with molasses, and then you just stir it every so often, and it won't stink, because the molasses will make it ferment. Okay. So it will take a few months, and when it's ready, it will be liquid, not stink as yeah. much <laughs> as, as, the, as the hydros. When you buy it from sardines or from mackerel or from uh, salmon, it stinks very bad, but it's good. And you only use one gallon per acre once or twice, and that's it. And only at the start of, your, of the process of, regen, of building real wealth. After two or three years, you don't need it. In, in Katy, Texas, I only used it one year, and that's it. Okay, sorry, I need to just check liquid fish. So just yeah, we, need to gets... use bio, we need to use biological methods that build up soil life at a low cost. There's a separate, I know I'm moving on, it's not my time for questions, but I do want to know who was the first person to think that liquidized fish would do this. But anyway, that's more of a question for out there. Joseph, carry on. We have about two more. Um, we know what you're going to do tomorrow, buy some fish heads and molasses. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think it could the, be a new business. Yeah. The, uh, you'd have to eat the rest of the fish. Um, so the other one was, what do you mean by a key line plow? Is that a subsoiler? Yes, but it's a special type of subsoiler that uh, PA Geomans developed in Australia. That is a straight tine, very narrow, that breaks open the ground underground and just leaves a slit on the top. So you actually fluff the soil up and it comes down, not as down as it was before. And um, you don't turn the soil. That's very important to not kill the mycorrhizae. And just on the theme of fish heads and molasses, um, what's the mix? Um, like, how would you mix it? Yeah, do you fill up the tank to the top, or well, to 20 centimeters of the top or 30 centimeters, and then you cover it with molasses. And that's okay. it. You let it. Uh, you let it ferment. Now you have to cover it with something or you will get flies and fly larva. But if you don't, the fly larva will eventually die and become protein also. And then just the final bit with that was, is it the proteins, amino acids that the, that's benefiting the mycorrhiza? Well, you can also make it with a green cut lucerne or alfalfa, but it's not the same high quality because it needs to be ocean fish because in the ocean, we have all the trace elements for life. If you look at the water in the ocean, it has the same ratio of minerals than human blood. That's another subject in itself, and I love it. Jamie, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Oh, Very perfect. Good. I've got my Madonna things on. Okay. Um, uh, can we just go back to your mineral buffet? Sure. If you, can you go back to that picture, Liz? Could you just explain your uh, a smorgasbord, I think you can, might call it, isn't it? A smorgasbord yes, um, of like minerals? A, uh, 12 to 16 choices, so the cow can select whatever she needs. Uh, for example, if you have high calcium soils or high calcium forages or high calcium grasses, and we need to remember that the cows or sheep or goats' bodies require a ratio ideally of 1.4 to 1.6 calcium parts per part of phosphorus. And if you provide only a, a, a mixed mineral and it contains calcium and phosphorus, the cow will never be able to overcome the calcium excess that inhibits the phosphorus absorption. That's one very easy Thing. Another thing, if you have an excess of sulfur or molybdenum, 
in your grasses, soil, or water, your cow or your sheep or goats will not be able to uh, absorb enough selenium and enough phosphorus. And phosphorus is essential for fertility, growth, and health because it's an essential part of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is the fuel for the cells of our bodies. So when you don't have enough phosphorus in relation to calcium, it doesn't become absorbed and you will see dull coats. We need shiny coats. Even in the winter, they should be shiny. If you see a, a, a black animal coat that is brownish in the top, that's a deficiency of copper, which is usually caused by an excess of another element. So that's why feeding a mixed mineral doesn't work and it's not a, a good way of doing it. So with that, so there's that sort of heavy lid, isn't it? So the cows flick that heavy lid and then they'll have certain seeking behaviors for, to identify the mineral. I suppose they yes. learn which minerals they're particularly after. Well, they don't learn. They try them and they have a retro aliment, uh, I don't know how to say, it, but a, a retro back process where if they make, if it makes them feel good, they will it's like go a feed, more. Yeah, feedback loop type thing. Feedback, sorry. Uh, yeah. My original language is Spanish, so I have to think in Spanish and then translate to English. But anyway, we have their phosphorus, magnesium, calcium, potassium, vitamin B, vitamin A, D, E, uh, cobalt, manganese, selenium, zinc, copper, uh, things like um, boron, um, salt, the salt we put it by itself. So if the cow requires only salt, she can eat only salt because it's very cheap. You don't want it mixed with the mineral because then that's the way the, the, the manufacturer does it to lower prices and you think that you're getting a good price. But we should look at the price per cow per year, not per pound of mineral. Because I don't know if anyone's there. sorry. I don't yeah. know if anyone's listening or you know Liz, but I, I'm not aware that you can buy minerals like this over here separately. Oh, we, we have we have to make them uh, over oh. there. Yes, uh, I I am I am looking for someone to do it over there. Um, in France, I haven't found anyone to do it, so it may be a good business for someone in the in the over there. Yeah. Because the feed compounders must be able to, they, you'll buy it as straight. Possibly. Yeah, I have never thought about it. I don't know. You can ask. If you don't have it, the, the best thing you can do at least is to put a white salt, sea salt by itself, your usual mineral by itself, and a mixture of uh, food grade monosodium phosphate, one to three parts, one part of that to three parts of salt mixed together and offer those three choices by itself so the cows can decide what she needs. Because there was quite a lot of, uh, especially on Twitter in the last few weeks, there's been quite a lot with the with the strange weather, so this dry period of them wet, a lot of pica in cows, do you mean? So this idea of eating a lot of soil or changing their sort of behavior to try and ingest quite a lot of soil. So yeah, there's, uh, there's been that, quite a lot of conversation that, about that. that. That means many things. Yeah. That means that, um, as the soil dries up and there's not enough mycorrhiza, the mineral content of the plants change. And then we start to see problems. Um, but the so, reason, so sorry, the, and, the, and the mineral buffet, you've put that in because, because of your non-selective grazing, those animals are being, are eating, well, eating what they need to eat, but that's, let, it's fundamental to that part. Let me go back to that. Uh, the, that mineral box you see there is a crutch. It's something that we need to do because our soil is not up to par. It's not as good as it should be in terms of humus content. So the minerals are not balanced and not there in enough quantities. So we use it because cows will return 80% of what they ingest via their manure and urine to the soil. If we distribute the manure correctly with the cows at high density and properly managed, we're going to increase the levels of the minerals that the soil requires by doing this. Eventually, the consumption of the cows of the minerals will go down after one, two, three years 
to where it's very low and the cost is very cheap. Uh, the best way to feed minerals is through the forages. But when we start, this is the best program that I have found to fix the soil. Okay, thank you. And then in terms of, um, so yeah, so in terms of- oh, let, let me finish. Oh. I'm very important because people are listening. Uh, to know if any mineral program is working correctly, take blood samples of your cows and send it to the lab, usually the universities, to find out if they are deficient on any trace element or major element. Sorry, go ahead. And, and, and so would you, you'd be doing that prior to it, putting something like this in and, and during just to check what's happening? Or when would you, when would you be doing those blood samples? Oh, I, I do it at, at least twice a year just to know if we are right on track or not. Any mineral program, not only this one, any. Yep, okay, thank you. Just before you move off um, the minerals, I'll just ask two questions that have come in. I, I'm just, I forgot to uh, pre-apologize as well at the start of today's call that uh, if I don't get through your questions, apologies. Um, but one is, how, do, how is the mineral lick box advantageous to using the likes of a mineral bolus? How is the mineral mi lick box what? Uh, more uh, is better than using a bolus, say mineral boluses on animals. Well, when you use a mineral bolus, you are forcing the animal into something that she may or may not need. For example, a black animal will require four times less copper than a red animal. If you don't take all those little nuances into account, or or a cow, uh, a calf that is drinking milk from a cow will have different min mineral needs than a cow that is giving the milk. Then it also depends on the water they are drinking and the forage species they are grazing and the maturity of the forage species. So I prefer not to use boluses, but um, sometimes you need to. For example, uh, in, in Florida, we have a very high excess of sulfur that doesn't allow um, selenium to be absorbed. And so we inject selenium a month before calving to avoid calving problems. And then there was just kind of on selenium, um, there's high molybdenum in soils in, um, mm. I think it's molybdenum, MO, this is where my science is failing me, um, yes, is. In, in Scotland, and often see selenium and copper deficiency in stock. So does the free access allow them to effectively come over, overcome this lockup? Up to a point, depends on how high the molybdenum excess is. In uh, Canada, I have a client that has two clients that have those problems. They have too much molybdenum and that inhibits the absorption of copper and phosphorus. And you can see it in the cows. So we are going to give them the monosodium phosphate and the copper separated so the cows can uh, balance themselves if, and then check the blood. If they aren't able, we need to do another thing, the next step. So we, that's why consulting is so important. It's not only, a, okay, I'm going to do this or that. You need to monitor anything you do. And these are just the, the last two kind of on this topic for now. Um, uh, one farmer said he's a situation when sometimes a cow picks up stones and rattles them around. Um, do you know if this is a sign of a pea deficiency? Yes, uh, usually a, a sign of deficiency also when they eat dirt or when they gnaw on bones, that will be a phosphorus deficiency, usually created by an excess of calcium or molybdenum or sulfur. And then kind of these were the last two questions are kind of the one. So um, I'll just read both of them out. Um, should you not be doing liver as bloods aren't 100%? And then kind of the similar uh, question, do you think... Sorry, continue. Liver is best if you are harvesting animals, but just for monitoring blood is good enough. And then the questions keep coming. Um, and then do you think we have good data to tell us what the blood levels of minerals should be? Whose standards do you use? I use the standards of the Michigan State University, which is, are very good. And then if cows are gnawing on bark, what do you think that's a sign of? It could be uh, that they are looking for the tannins and the bark uh, to relieve the paras paratis parasitism, or they may be looking for a mineral. Right, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you go. Um, so 
I've shown the picture of the people, this picture several times now. So please, please explain the picture. Also, this is when we were talking before, this is sort of where it started in, in terms of your sort of the, the real wealth farming. Yes, uh, that's the first uh, class we gave in Mexico to the Chihuahua ranchers. And that's 120 to 130 persons there. And that was in 2014. And by now, there are already over 2 million hectares in that state practicing these methods with great success. What do you think was the trigger for that? I accept you were there, but also what were they finding in that area that just wasn't quite working? Well, they were doing conventional, conventional grazing where they were uh, continuous grazing or they were trying uh, tall grazing and selective grazing. And that just doesn't work, especially in such a harsh environment where the usual rainfall falls in three months of the year and it's 16 to 18 inches in that area. Other areas are uh, eight inches average. So that's a desert and we have had great success there. I think what moved them is that they are a very united people and they are very uh, entrepreneurs and they want to improve their lives and their land. That's what moved them. And their motto is for the love of the land. I love that. Okay. So, so Jamie, I'm just thinking now might be a good time to um, explain high dent, uh, non-selective high density grazing in relation to um, selective high density grazing. Yes, yes, of course. It's easy for her to say. I know, not very, <laughs> doesn't flow off my tongue very well. Yeah, I'm going to to talk about the differences in selective tall grazing or mob grazing versus severe non-selective grazing. And it has to do with basic plant physiology. When we see how a grass plant grows, uh, we need to remember that when the plant sits out or is very tall, it has a lot of stem, it starts to create a hormone called auxin that inhibits the development of new tillers and new leaves. So, because we want a more efficient solar panel, that means more active growing points per square meter and a better leaf to stem ratio. And that depends on the previous type of grazing we did is that uh, tall grazing doesn't work. Uh, tall grazing will shade out the seedlings and the growing points, eventually killing them Tall grazing with selective grazing will take all the leaves and leave the stems. And we need to remember that photosynthesis is being done by the leaves for the most part and respiration is being done by the stems for the most part. So if we want fat roots full of carbohydrate reserves, we need a high leaf to stem ratio so more of the energy being captured by the plant is stored as a carbohydrate reserve in the crown and the roots and less is being expended in the respiration process. When we graze only the leaves and leave the stems unconsumed, we not only lower our cow days harvested per hectare per year, but we also lower the carbohydrate reserves of those plants. And so, so in simple terms, wait, wait, you're... Wait, 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 sorry, wait. Sorry, sorry. We need to remember we're trying to increase humus content because humus is a real soil fertility. So to do that, uh, we need a high leaf to stem ratio. I have a picture there, if you can find it. It's a, a, a hand of a man holding oh. grass, green grass. It's not on my... I, can, I know where it is, but it's not on here. I can find it. Bear with me for a second. Important one for this. And when you increase the leaf to stem ratio, it, even your, um, your stockpile forage will have a better uh, food value than if it's all full of stems, of stems. Stems are not good foods for cows unless they are mixed with leaves. Okay, so, so when we, you, you don't, you're not into the trampling process. Excuse me? You, so we, mob we talk grazing. about mob grazing so you you do a lot of trampling and so you're you're thinking well graze it very hard and then a, a long rest period 
Yes, uh, we also want to keep the soil covered. We don't want the bare soil to show. But we need to remember when you do correct severe non-selective grazing and high stocking, uh, uh, high stock densities, uh, you leave like 15 to 25 percent of trampled material in the ground. So it's a function. The litter left behind is a function of how much was there to start with. That's why we need longer rest periods, which benefit the health of our cows also. When they only graze the top, now I'm going to talk about uh, like a nutritionist, which I am. A ruminant, oh, that's, that's the grass, oh, that's, that's the same range. Uh, as a nutritionist, the rumen functions in batches. So uh, what do we need? We need a balanced ration. We don't want them to select the highest sugar portions of the grass, which will be the tops. They are highest in sugars and highest in protein and lower in fiber. And that will create scours and that will create a high pH rumen, a high pH system, and a high pH urine. And what the, the pathogens that create strawberry wart, uh, food rot, uh, retain, well, no, uh, mastitis or pink eye. What do they need? They require a high pH of eight and above. And we want our cows to be at a 6.5 to 7 pH where everything is more efficiently absorbed. I also teach a course on, on nutrition, but it takes like half a day. But it's important just to remember that we want the rumen of our cows to be healthy. And we observe that in the manure. And so that, so the photo there is just showing, do you mean the, a really high proportion of leaf, but, and all, but quite long really, but that in terms of that balance of energy, protein and fiber within that. Yes, that's a, a high leaf to stem ratio. That's what I'm trying to show there. Yeah, and maybe I'm trying to find that. And so then this is in terms of manure. So that's what you've, do you mean images of sort of this, sort of good fiber digestion type example of what that manure would look like so relatively firm really dung beetles would love it oh, not, from not a previous firm, conversation not, not very sloppy for example you have cool season grasses so your main problem will be acidosis because cool season grasses their energy is in the form of sugars while warm season grasses the energy is in the form of fats or oils sugar is 55 percent oxygen when the optimum for the body is 40.5% oxygen. It's like when you do adjust a carburetor in a car. Too much oxygen will create acidosis and the manure when it dries will be covered by, by a white crust. I'm sure you have seen that in your environment and that, that means you are wasting money or resources and your cow health is not as it should be. And so a way of, even within this sort of environment would be slightly mature crops that would help some of that, but there's still a risk just because of that's what the plant in cold season grasses do. They store it in sugars. Yes, so we need to let it mature longer and we need cattle that can do well on more mature forages, grazing non-selective. Uh, grazing non-selective is not as easy for the cows as grazing selectively. It's like if you have two corrals side by side and you have a hundred cows, you put 50 on one and 50 on the other and you feed the first corral uh, all, the, all, all they want. And every time they refuse it, you throw it away and put new one, new feed in the bunks. And on the other one, you put, uh, you fill the bunks once a day and, uh, and you don't put anything more until they finish, which will be more demanding to live in, in which corral. Well, the one, the one that they have to finish everything, that's non-selective. So we need to meet correct selection criteria to be able to have animals that make a good profit by maintaining their good body condition and can improve the land on which they graze. And so that is very much, it's not selecting the plants, it's selecting the types of animals that will do well in those situations. And I suppose by and then thinning out, culling those ones that don't do well. It's a continuum. Uh, the cattle that we use are the sheep or goats. I have pictures also of sheep and goats. Uh, the type of animal we decide to raise 
will impact the management required for them and the benefits are detrimental to, the, to our soils. Uh, we can have pampered animals that are high maintenance and that will produce um, poor soils or degraded soils because they require more, many more crutches and we will not have money to take home. When we have animals that can fend for themselves and it's just the criteria, the selection criteria. I'm not talking about changing breeds. You have very good breeds there in, in, in England. I am talking about the selection criteria. And we can see in these animals, the animal on the top, the brown animal, that's a conventionally selected high input animal. And the same breed in the red one below it, that's a correct selected animal, bull. Then the black ones, the one on the very top is a black Aberdeen Angus. That's a perfect animal there. Then the one in the middle, the black one, that's a conventionally selected, tall and lanky. That's a very poor animal that will give daughters that will not do well on their uh, low input farming. And the one at the bottom is again correctly selected. So part of that selection criteria is is about the physical characteristics, isn't it, in terms of height, masculinity, all of those factors. So it's a slightly different way to, Jim, we would tend to be promoted around estimated breeding values, so the sort of genetic potential element. But this is, yes. this is very much building in that sort of physical stature element too. I would like to take it a little bit, bit further. I, I want to select as nature does. Nature has been selected correctly for many, many years, and you can see it in wildlife. You, if you go to Africa, you don't see skinny, high input zebras, or gerenuk, or wildebeest, or lions, or elephants, or whatever. They have to be well adapted, or they are cooled out by predators. Well, in our because we only have one or two or three species to manage our land instead of a myriad of species, we need, to, we need to select as nature does and play the part of the predator with electric fences and with cooling instead of letting them die of disease and paras parasitism and predators, we cool the ones that are weak and don't do well. That's so the way it works. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. So I was just going to, so a few questions have come in about sheep uh, grazing, tall covers and stuff. And it, we just find grazing in this country um, with tall covers and sheep just doesn't really work. Is that because we've got the wrong type of sheep? What, 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 how do you do your sheep? Okay, I had a thousand sheep in my own farm in Mexico in the tropics. Uh, the best way to do sheep is in a leader modified leader follower rotation with cat with beef cows that's the best way and that's what we are doing in um, in iowa we take the sheep to selectively graze one full rotation ahead of the cows and use the cows to condition the grass for the following graze by the sheep Okay. That way, we keep a longer rest period in between sheep's and sheep rotations and cow rotations. And as we know, each other species parasites are not bad for the other species. So by doing it this way, we kill two stone, two birds with one stone, and it's yeah. been working very good for years now. Okay, that's good. Uh, having only sheep makes it very hard. In environments where sheep are more um, profitable than beef cows, the best way is to do both. Uh, do you, how much mixed farming like that do you see? Is it the norm or is it... Depends on environment, but the environments like Scotland, England, uh, Canada and Northern United States, that's the best um, way to do it. But the, up, the ultimate way to do it is to have a uh, high priced fruit or not trees growing in the pasture with oh well that leads us on to mulberry trees uh well yeah uh, in terms of, of people, people yeah before we get carried away with the trees okay. 
in terms of so in terms of just for those interested in sort of the correct selection for bull so it would be this very masculine type do you mean certainly that the top angus the would, ones on the right they're very masculine yeah and in terms of they would be they're quite big creatures aren't they for forage based systems but they've got quite a lot of pro they've got a lot of pros too they are larger. You see this red angus bull that is on the top of the right slide? Yeah. Can, can you see that one? Can you put that one? That one? No. Uh, no top yeah, of the right the slide. Yeah, that one. Okay, we see a, a two year, two and a half year Hereford bull on the top left. That's from the, uh, the desert of Coahuila, Mexico, and now he's in Texas. He's very short, a frame of a two or 1.8, but heavy. Then the red angus bull to the right of that one, that, that weighed over 1,000 kilos, and he was a frame of 3.3. That's, that's in the hills, of, the sand hills of Nebraska. Then on the bottom on the left, that's a bull that I selected myself. Uh, I bred in, in the Mashona farm in Florida. Here he is at uh, two years old. Then the next one is a cow that have a two and a three again in low quality forages in Katy, Texas. And the little bull calf on the right is a five, year, five days old and thus the best bulls are born looking like a bull, but it's one in a thousand. So that's one, easy, not easy to find. And so it's the idea that also the females are very feminine, aren't they? So it's a very, in terms of you looking for those sort of Yes, and each one has its characteristics that I teach on the course. Uh, we want the bulls to look very masculine and behave. And that's a, a result of high testosterone. And the females, we need them to be very feminine and behave as, as a female. And that's high estrogen. A high testosterone bull will give a high testosterone female, estrogen female, and a high estrogen dam will give a high testosterone bull. That's very important. And so that in terms of sort of your one of your key characteristics would be this cor the correct animal for this for this grazing system. Yes. And, and, and talking about hormone balance is called sexual dimorphism. The differentiation between a male and a female should be extreme. A male should be uh, 30, 40 percent larger or heavier and behave and look the part. Thank you. Um, so, uh, sorry, just, Joseph. Oh, just before on, you move on, we've just have a few questions mainly around kind of grazing. And Liz, your screen share has changed a little bit. I don't know if it's on other ones. I can see your notes page rather than your presentation. Hmm. Um, so just on a few grazing questions. Um, does using different grazing methods in a year increase species diversity? So for example, skim grazing followed by long rest and then a high intensity grazing. Um, what, is, what is a skim grazing? I imagine just let, not, ugh, not letting the animals uh, hit the pasture too tight. Okay, if you do that, what will happen to the best species? Wouldn't they be grazed preferentially compared to the worst species? Oh, it's not my question. I don't have the answer to that. But, <laughs> I know. Um, I, know. I, I, I see, I see your logic, though. No, what I'm talking is that if you want to create a pasture species shift, composition shift, do selective grazing. Then you will have more and more every year of the worst species coming up and taking the hold of the, your pasture and your best species will eventually disappear. If you want the best species to overtake the worst species, you increase humus content, you do severe non-selective grazing, so every species have to start on an even plane and the ones with the largest leaves, which are the most nutritious, will capture more energy and will dominate the narrow leaves ones. So you will end with better species. And as the humus content increases, you will have even better species because we need to remember that more humus uh, releases more nutrients up to uh, 40 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year for each 1% of organic matter and up to 125,000 liters of water per hectare per year, each 1% of organic matter. 
So it's very important to increase humus content. Um, so then we just, uh, it's a bit kind of around grasses and so there's a few of these questions kind of similar. So for cool season grasses, what ideally is the entry and exit heights and how long should the rest period be? And kind of a follow on, is rye grass suitable? Because it just seems to want to set seed. Okay, first question, how tall? As tall as you can without it losing nutrition value for your type of animal you are grazing. Usually that means two or three feet tall. Is that the same for sheep? No. Sheep need to be selectively grazed because they have much higher requirements. They are more efficient converters because they are smaller and that has to do with their uh, relative intake, which is determined by the metabolic size. So being smaller, they can consume a much higher percentage in dry matter of their body weight, but they do require higher quality. So by grazing them selectively, we exploit those characteristics of sheep. But then a full rotation later, we need to take all those leaves and stems down to the ground to create a more leafy pasture for next grazing by the sheep. So basically you go through, so you've got a set number of fields, 20 fields for argument's sake, and you've moved those cows all the way around and you've done, and you've, and you've taken it down ready for the sheep. So what, how long, I know this is how long is a piece of string, but what would be the rest period between you've grazed it well with cows and when would your sheep go in? Uh, you have to tell me the, the it's spring, summer, winter, uh, fall, the change. But, but it could be, is it? a week in the summer or the spring? Or is it a no, month no, no, in no, the spring? No. 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 Uh, well, if I give a recipe, it will be this. It will be a recipe for disaster. Okay. So I can give you approximations we do in Northern Iowa and in yes. Canada. It will be uh, 30 days in the lodge growth, 30 days behind the chip come the cow, and 30 days behind the cows come the chip. Okay. Then as the summer slump comes, we go to 60 days, then in the fall, we stay at 60 days and we start to stockpile for winter use. Okay. Um, I think that kind of answers some of the rest of the questions because the more, more of them are about um, when to put the animals in and the length of rotation um, in terms of days. But I think you just explained it. It could be 30 days between grazing. Um, and then the last question was explain what the full term rotation in a leader follower system which we've just talked about. Which we just talked about. So I think we've, yeah, I think we've covered. Never, never do a follow, leader follower right behind them. Always put a full rotation in between the two groups or you're going to have the, the follower group fall out in body condition. You, need, you see, it's a continuum. We need to think of our, our land, our animals, our grasses, our wallet. We need to bring harmony back to the land and not dissociate them. I think, and also, and Nick and I have, this is a side point, but Nick and I have suggested like a lot of these, the talks we've done have been cattle based. So we do, we are very conscious that we need to think about how some of these systems fit with sheep because they do have a very different requirement. And, and goats, we are managing goats uh, to clear brush and they are a great addition. Um, and then I think the last one, I think, um, how tall is the grass when you take the cows out? Oh, there, there are some pictures that, that you could show this, please. Yep, I'm on maybe trees one, now. The one in, maybe the one in Scotland from the Brewer Brothers. Oh. So what we probably forgot to say while Liz is um, finding these pictures is we came across Jamie via the Brewster Brothers because um, they use you as a consultant, don't they, Jamie? And um, so all this is thanks to them, really. Um, and I'm, I'm, well, they are on the line because they've been asking questions. So, um, yeah, that's how it came about. It's a pleasure to work with them because they immediately grasp it and they are doing so well. Yeah. But it, may, I mean, sorry, let's go on. No, I'm just thinking in terms of residual. So, but with so it's it would be relatively tight, though, wouldn't it? So, no, five it, it centi taken down. Uh, uh, there are some pictures there. If you can show them, please. I'm trying, trying to find them. Okay, uh, I had them here on my phone. 
I can find everything else, but at the moment. So, um, Jamie, are you planning to come over at any time? Yes. Uh, I should be in France in September, but the COVID may change everything. And from there, I should go to Portugal, and I would love to go to Scotland and England, if possible. Yes. Well, <clears throat> next next summer, I believe, there's a little thing on called Carbon Call that might be worth, um, worth visiting. Mm. And um, while I continue to try and find these photos, do you want to talk about trees? Oh, yeah, I love trees. Okay, here is a picture of the Bru Brewer brothers. This is how it should look after grazing. Oh, that's you quite clear, see? actually. Huh? Yep, yep. Oh, wait, no, that's... Oh. Okay, Isn't this magic? You're in Florida and we're doing this. Oh, I love it. You can see how it is before grazing and after grazing. That's how oh, we should do it. Because that that will, if you allow the, the, the enough time to rest, the roots will be full of carbohydrates by then. The leaf to stem ratio that comes after that type of grazing will be the best. And, if, and it will, the regrowth will be much faster because of the higher uh, carbohydrate reserves. Uh, it's um, not true that we need uh, leaves left behind to produce more grass, as the tall grazing people say. In, in reality, what they leave before, behind, be, behind the cows when you selectively graze our stems and not leaves. And stems continue the respiration process, consuming energy that should be in the roots to for a next spurge of growth. So that's the wrong approach. They fail to understand plant physiology. So, so Jamie, your thoughts on the kind of New Zealand dairy rotational grazing, just to throw a spanner in there. Can you just uh, talk a bit about what, what you think about that? Sure, can you, can you show please the slide of my farm in Mexico? I Sorry, have Liz. a. Because <laughs> you know, I only realize that I'm also can be seen when my look of panic comes on. Right. <laughs> <Are we seeing? laughs> okay. Hopefully. Okay. Um, so, no, no, the one with the green grass and the rows of trees. The one at the bottom. Uh, Is that one? Okay, I can bottom. show that. But that's a far, far away. That's my farm on the left. And I have a, a great dairy there. We milk 300 cows twice a day. So yes, ask me about dairy. I'm a dairy nutritionist and a dairy farmer. So the picture with the trees on it, like agroforestry type, that's where you've got your dairy cows? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, ma'am, I love it. Okay, um, so New Zealand tart style dairy would be uh, very quick rotations, relatively low covers. So yep. just tell us what you do. Okay. Uh, in New Zealand, they have the problem of uh, very short, short roots. So whenever they have two weeks without rain, they call it a drought, which we call a dry period. But they, they, it makes national headlines. That's due to grazing short and grazing very fast. That creates a problem in the health of the dairy cow where they end up milking off their backs because when protein is in excess of available energy, the ammonia is released in the rumen and then they have to take the energy from their backs. And what do we need to produce estrogen, the, the feminine hormone required for a cow to cycle? We need fat. So if we don't have a fat cow at calving, we will not have a, a very fast rebreeding and that will make our intercabin period wider and our, our, our cows in milk days longer. We know that a dairy cow gives more milk the first three months and then levels down. So the more days in milk they have, the less milk they will produce. That's why this is so important. Now, with this, my farm being in a tropical environment, I cannot let it grow as tall as you could with a cool season grass because the quality will be lost. So what I do is try to maintain the quality high enough for the class of animal that I have, which is a dairy cow. So I cannot let it grow as tall as you could in your environment. 
Now that Bermuda grass you see there is being grazed by five cow dairy cows per hectare and it's never fertilized. So that's my measure of success. Okay, could, okay. We would argue, or some could argue, um, but within those New Zealand dairy systems, they have selected a cow that appears to cope within that situation, doesn't it? So they, it's, they have used selected breeding to get I mean, relatively small cows that are highly fertile in those situations. Yes, if you read the book, uh, Grass to Milk by um, in New Zealand, like in 1960, 1970, uh, they talk all about this, about the correct selection criteria and the smaller frame animal being more efficient in converting grass, uh, tons of grass to tons of milk. And that's where I started my learning in the, in the, uh, with that book from New Zealand way back then. But since then, they have made the mistake of following the US for higher animal yield per animal performance instead of per hectare. And now they are tending toward larger animals and more grain feeding. Yeah. And they have screwed it up in their grazing to where all New Zealand is severely overgrazed. If we define overgrazing, it's not how severe you graze, but how fast you return. If you return before the plant has replenished its carbohydrate reserves, you are effectively overgrazing. That's why I say that in New Zealand, they are overgrazing the whole country. And so that, and that, do you mean, we're coming out of this dry spell uh, here, which is, do you mean, and, and quite a lot of farms were quite, well, we had a, we had a combination really of factors that led to not a huge amount of grass being on farm before it then went dry. We had a cold spring, wet spring, and it just the grass didn't get going. I accept that not enough grass was brought through the winter, but we did have we had a certain interesting set of circumstances as we hit the dry. So a lot of people didn't have the leaf area to get them through the beginning of that dry period. But in so in terms of developing resilient systems. So it's sort of getting those root reserves there, isn't it? So they can withstand more of a challenge. And what, what else could, do you think people could do to help them sort of deal with those drier periods that we're seeing more often, really? Okay, it all starts with the previous year's grazing management. If we had been grazing like they do in New Zealand and we did a drought, like we did last year in France, I am a consultant for a farm there in, for, in uh, Dimuchin, from the, the Buddhists, they are from England, they moved to France, and they were in a drought last year, uh, three months, no rain. Everything was brown all around and they were green. And they saved 40,000 euros the first year by not feeding uh, hard feed and by grazing their animals instead of having them in the barn year round. And now this year it rained and you can see the results. Maybe you have the picture there of Catherine uh, stringing the fence in a very tall grass that reaches up to her chest. I know where it is, but it's not on this presentation. There's a lot of photos in my defense. There was a lot of photos. I know, I know. It's a picture from her back. Yeah, I know it. I know exactly, but I'm not, it's not here. I'll find I'm it. I'm going to show you the video so you can see it. I might have some videos on here. That's her. Hang on, Liz, you need to take your um, thing off. Oh. Here we go. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Try again. Sorry, Jamie. Just try again. It was okay, my competence. You need to speak, Jamie. Okay, there she is. Uh, stringing the poly braid for the cows for the next break. You can see how tall the grass is. There is the herd of limousine cattle. They are not very low maintenance, but we are doing well because we have cool season grasses, which are much higher quality than warm season grasses. Okay, so, so, so that's the result I'm talking about and, what, and that's how we need to increase our carrying capacity year by year by producing more cow days per hectare instead of less and at a very low cost to no cost. Um, I'm just conscious of time, yeah. Jamie. I think we might need a part two with you. We might what? We might need a part two. 
Okay, sure, yes. yes <laughs> um, so, um, <laughs> Joseph, do you have any questions before we, yes, before we go we to have trees? A yes, we have a few. And a f well, a few are tree related as well. Um, okay. uh, we'll start at the top. Um, uh, fall uh, forage trees. Um, so, there's a few questions of forage trees. Would they survive in the UK, such as tree lucerne, willow, poplar, and ivy work? Yes, but can you grow mulberry? A bit. No? Um, yeah, I think we can, but I, it wouldn't be a very common. Let, I might Google it. Talk amongst it's a bit cold. It's a bit cold and miserable here, Jamie. We're, miserable. That's why miserable. Okay. Then uh, whatever <laughs> grows there. Yeah, every, every, uh, can you grow a black locust that grows in the cold areas? Well, you may have to research some, but there is a very good book called uh, uh, Tree Forages that you could uh, consult. And it's from the United States, but in the United States, you have very similar environment in parts to you. Uh, what I know that will grow uh, is uh, poplars, yes. They can be pollard. If you see this large tree there that, with me in the bottom, that's on a monastery in Fort Calcaire, France. And that tree is like 300 years old and has been pollard. And that had been pollard a year before and that's a regrowth. So it's a very good uh, summer dry period forest reserve. It will not be there in the winter, but in the summer it will be. You can also plant a willows in England and willows are also good for forage long for a longer period. We can grow so mulberries. So, so um, Jamie, just tell me why mulberry? Why is it so? Because it's the highest quality forage. Since it was bred to feed the silk worms, silk to make silk, mm -hmm. is the highest quality forage and has no anti-nutritional factors. Most other forages are too high in tannins or too high in lignin or have some anti-nutritional factors. And uh, mulberry doesn't. So it's the best, it, it's higher quality than lucerne hay, and it's almost the same quality as grain. So it pays to plant it in rows, and then just cut it with a chainsaw, altern, alternate it whenever there is a need for the cows. Now, I don't, I don't favor monocultures, even of trees. So I always inter, intercede them with other species. So your picture in that corner down there with the, the agroforestry, we'd probably call it, are you grazing that and they are browsing the trees, but then you also cut the trees as well? Yes. Whenever necessary, you pollard them. Okay. And um, it will be a great tree to plant instead of an, in the edge rows of your field or in lines in between. I plant this every 34 meters, the rows that you see on my farm. The whole farm is covered with trees at that distance because it is so hot in the summer and high humidity that it goes over uh, 45 to 48 Celsius. And just on the dairy side, there's one or two kind of dairy. What um, breed of cattle do you have? Dairy cows do you have? Because it's so hot there, I have to use a tropical milk in criollo crosses with machona so they can maintain their body condition in those low quality tropical forages and, and high fertility in that very high heat index environment. And then kind of on that I was talking about the grasses for your dairy cattle, are you looking for a better balance of sugar to protein in mature grasses which age, which aids an increase of rumen efficiency? Because it's the tropics, our species are warm season perennials, which perennials is the most profitable way to go. So their energy is not in the form of sugars, but in the form of oils. And oils, instead of being 55% uh, oxygen like sugar, are 13% oxygen. So it's a whole different ball game. So you need to manage differently. That's why trees are so important in all environments. And I suppose one question is, what is warm? What are warm season grasses in terms of? Yeah. C4, C4, uh, pathway, respiratory pathway grasses. That means they are five to seven times more efficient in the use of water to convert to dry matter, but that dry matter will be much higher in fiber, lignin, lower in energy and protein, and much uh, 
higher in heat generation when it's being digested. So the best option for you will be to uh, combine warm season annuals into your cool season grasses before your summer slump. That means to plant something like uh, uh, with a no-till drill on, on after severe grazing, severe non-selective grazing, you plant uh, Sudan grass, the piper variety will be good, into your severely grazed cool season grass. And that will get, provide you with very good uh, grass in the summer when it gets hotter. And you will have, uh, Sorghum Sudan is one of the grasses that returns more sugar exudates to the soil. Up to 80% of its energy is returned to the soil. And, this, and also, there's a question also on sort of herbs and clovers. You've, we've mentioned clovers a bit, haven't we, in terms of, but also, um, do you know, there's a great enthusiasm at the moment for those sort of diverse herbal mixes going in here. What's your thoughts on them? On, on clovers? Oh no, on sort of plantains, chicories, introducing more herbs or forbs into the, into the mix. Of course, yes. And the more biodiversity, the better. Each species that we can bring into our pasture will bring another seven species at least of other organisms. So I love what um, the book called Fertility Farming it published in England in 1960s or 1940, no, 1940, uh, by Newman Turner. And he talks about lay farming and using um, deep taproot herbs to improve the soil mineral recycling of deeper layers. And I usually plant plantain in my more temperate environments and chicory and different types of clovers and grasses that can reseed themselves. That's the best way to go. Okay, thank you. Along with trees, very important. Um, we did have one question, Liz, on crude protein from the WhatsApp group, and I can't remember. Jamie, could you remember what it was? It was to do with you? shade, wasn't it? It was to do, there was an element of the balance oh, between yes. crude protein and yes. therefore the requirement the for shade. Yes, the question was how does protein level impact the health of the animal and because the animal is going to be panting and will require shade even if it's not very hot. You see, when we have an excess of protein in relation to the available energy, and I always say available energy because what makes it available is how close you are to, in the oxygen content in dry matter basis to 40.5. If you are 36, 38, like a green, lush ryegrass, it will not be available. And you will have the animal, instead of having a, a 6.4 hydrogen content, which is the energy, as in the field that they use for the rocket launching, uh, then the protein for a 6.4, the protein requirement is 8%. So ammonia is not released when that protein is digested by the rumen microorganisms. Because her grasses in your environment are usually 16, 18, or 24% protein, you're going to have all that extra protein being digested by the microorganisms using the carbohydrate portion of the amino acid molecule and releasing the amine group, which becomes ammonia, and being a gas is and the rumen is gas permeable, it will go directly into the blood. In the blood, it will take the, the, the space of oxygen and will make the cow pant even when it's not that hot. And that's why you need more shade. But how can I prove this is true? Well, just give your best cow a handful of urea and make her drink some water and she will walk a few paces and fall down and will die from lack of oxygen. <laughs> don't do that. It, <laughs> to, don't do it. Don't do it. Just to prove it. Do it on your neighbor's cow. Then you take, no. her, then you take some blood out and you see the, the, the blood turning brown instead of red. And that proves my theory that the hemoglobin turned to metahemoglobin, which is now taking the part, the space of the oxygen 
by ammonia. So it's not, it's not actually a heat, they're not panting because of heat distress, they're panting because they haven't got enough oxygen, basically. The so environment is mainly because they cannot take that ammonia out as fast as it's being created, and that takes the space of the oxygen in the blood, and because in the lungs is where this gas interchange occurs, they cannot get enough oxygen into their blood. It's like when you go into a high altitude and you're, you, had, you need to be adjusted. So let's not make our cows miserable by grazing correctly a more mature forage in your environment. Um, just one quick question about why are your trees 34 meters? Why is it every 34 meters? Yeah, because you don't want, even in, a, in the tropics, you, oh, that's an interesting video that I would like to show if there is time. Uh, yeah. 34 meters because you don't want to have more than 30% shade because then that will lower the biomass production of your forages. You want it to be in top of what you can usually get instead of instead of. You want uh, like a second floor in your farm. There, is, there you can see severe non-selective grazing on low quality uh, warm season perennial grasses with adapted animals and if, when I go, I will, I will teach the whole course. Okay, um, so Liz, I'm, I'm just conscious of time and we, I just, we want to talk a little bit, Jamie, just about meat, about quality of meat, grass-fed meat, and then because our next talk is from a, with a paleo chap. Great, so, I love it. Uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on grass-fed, grain-fed, well, I have, as I said, I'm a ruminant nutritionist, so I work on 30,000 head feedlots. And the problem is when you feed grain, the grain digestion produces lactic acid, and the rumen is not suited for lactic acid. So it becomes burnt up. So after a certain period of feeding a high grain ration, ration to a ruminant, the rumen is black on the inside because it has been burnt by the lactic acid and that animal will die if it's not slaughtered. So just ask yourself if that is good for your health, to, buy, to eat an animal that is stressed and is dying from lactic acid poisoning. So that, for me, that's enough because I've seen it yeah. on thousands of animals and, and when they are slaughtered. And, 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 and then you see these animals that are grazed and are happy and have long lives and don't get sick. And that's what, what I'm talking about, bringing harmony to the land, to the man, cattle, and the land. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that's... How can you have harmony if, you're, if you are mistreating your animals? That, that doesn't make sense. But now on the other side, nutrition, human nutrition. Um, well, you know, you're, I think you're going to talk about that. Um, the the omega-3 fatty acids, the conjugated linoleic acids, they are very important for hum, human health. And we are usually, our diet has a high omega-6 ratio to omega-3. And we need a one-to-one. -one, and we are usually eating a diet that is 30 to one. And what makes our brain mostly is omega-3 grasses. Uh, grasses, not omega-3 fatty acids. Okay. Um, Joseph, is there any more last questions? Um, there's a few. I'll try and go through them quickly. Um, who's the author of the tree fork? Or was there a book recommended? Russell. Russell. R-U-S-S-E-L-L. -S -L. That's all I remember. But you can find it. It's called Tree Crops. That's the correct name, I'm sorry. And it's by Russell, and you can find it online on Google. Um, then what effect does silt aer slit aerating, I should say, soils have on the micro? Micro-mizer. Could you repeat the question? I didn't hear so, about the soil. So slit aerating. Slit so aeration? You, um, yeah, Just a bit like key line plowing, but shallower. So, oh. yeah. Well, no, the key line goes as shallow as the hard pan is. There is no yeah. need to go 
deeper because then you're going to spend more money in pulling that key line plow. You just need to go an inch below the, the hard pan. To so find the slicer out would probably go maximum of about, oh, depending on how new your blades are, about 12 centimeters. So what's that, four inches? 15 centimeters. If you go shallower than that, you overturn the soil. So you, you need With to go line, 15, yeah. 30 meters. And then if the, if the hard pan is uh, four inches deep, you, you're okay. If but it's the point, a, I suppose because we know from a, the tillage will, will kill the mycorrhiza. Yes. Will that, the key line plowing or equivalent, slightly shallower version, would that also damage it? If it, over, if it turns the soil, yes. You need to go a little deeper to not turn the soil. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's an inversion that does it rather than necessarily the tillage itself. Correct. Okay. Yes, because we have a aerobic microorganisms and anaerobic microorganisms. When we turn the soil, we put the anaerobic on the top to be killed by air, and we put the aerobic underground to be killed by lack of air. We okay. don't want that. We want more air, more life, not less life. Um, and just another, for information. Another very important thing, uh, don't try to grow that which wants to die and don't try to kill that which wants to live. <laughs> oh, <laughs> see, it's like a motto it. for, the, for the rest of our lives. <laughs> oh. um, I'm conscious of time, so there is one or two questions left, but apologies that I didn't get to them. What we might do is go through them and maybe see can we answer after. Yep. Um, I just know it's hard to get through them all. Um, and yeah, and, and if you're interested in those books, quite a few people have put the links to books they've found. They've found the links and it's on oh, the chat. So if you My interested. book, I, I will recommend my book. It's called... <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine like a slightly a version, a copy of it just appearing next to you. Uh, I don't have it with me right oh. now. Oh, he's an impact. You know, but you can put my information there. Yeah, yeah, no, we'll circulate it. I'm on YouTube. There are many, many videos and courses that I have given and um, talks in different environments. Yeah, and, and also if once, well, yeah, let us know when you're over this way and then if people are interested, then they can come, they can have a chat with you while you're this okay. way. So hopefully, did you say September maybe? Or maybe That's what they said, uh, the agroforestry department of the uh, French government. That's what they say, but I don't know about the COVID. It depends. Okay. But um, well, thank you. In terms of summary, so I think we've learned. I think it's just it's quite interesting because it's challenged quite a lot of the thinking that we encounter here, particularly this sort of mob grazing, trampling versus doing building up those extra dates. So that's quite an interesting game. Just people thinking slightly differently about that. I'm particularly interested in min the mineral side and just yeah. how to particularly getting those animals to decide for themselves. It's a bit like environment enrichment, um, and. Um, Yes, I just think it's been really interesting. Thank you very much. I don't know what Nick, Nick might have to Yeah, add. no, I just think it's been intensely enjoyable. So, Jamie, thank you very much. Thank you for having and, um, me. Yeah. yeah, no, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, uh, and, Liz, uh, Liz, could you put my information there so people can reach me? The WhatsApp, uh, the email? I, no, because I haven't got it as a picture. There's a shocker. But we will send an email to everybody who came on the webinar and we'll put it out that way. That we'll would make sure be this also goes out on YouTube and and as a podcast. Okay. Um, so we'll but Jamie, if you if you did want to come over next June, to Carbon Calling, we'd love to have you. Uh, you mean uh, 2021, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I would love that. Yes. Uh, please send me the link to the YouTube later on WhatsApp. I will do. Yeah, we won't. We'll uh, put it up. Uh, it won't be up instantly, but yes, we will sure send you the link through. And um, thanks to everyone who's who's listening, and thanks for um, great questions. Thanks to Joseph, doing a great job with his lovely Irish accent. And uh, yeah, no, uh, all all good, Liz. Are you? Are we ready yeah. to uh, depart? And I keep no. forget to say the carbon calling dates. We were vague because I couldn't remember them. So they are the twenty sixth and the twenty seventh of June. So it's a Saturday for the main conference, and Sunday being the workshop with Joel. So that's. Um, they, so, yeah, to confirm, it's moved to the 26th, 27th of June, 2021. Still in the I same think, location. Yeah, Cumbria. God's County. One of them. <laughs> but thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye, Bye for now. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.